we are making a like a like a meal in a way for people. And I think that like I think of myself a little bit as like a confectioner. You know, I like I make sweets. <laughs> Behind every game card or board game cover is an artist whose job it is to bring an imaginary world to life. And we believe that by getting to know the artist behind that art, it helps you connect with that world on a deeper level. With that in mind, we had an opportunity to sit down with Nicholas Cole, the artist behind the Mickey, Elsa, and Cruella Lorcana preview cards. As you can imagine, there's still a lot that Disney and Ravensburger are trying to keep under wraps about Lorcana. So although we couldn't talk a ton about that, we did have an opportunity to talk about Nick's other projects, passions, and really just get to know him as a person. And he is wonderful. If you enjoy these explorations of Lorcana and gaming art, please consider subscribing. It means a lot and really keeps us going. So with that, we'll let Nick introduce himself. Enjoy. Enjoy. For for you, for fans of, of Lorcana, um, who may encounter you for the very first time, how would you introduce yourself to, to new fans? <laughs> uh, well, I, it's a big one, uh, as questions go. Um, yeah. I think, you know, in, in the work that I do, I guess first I'd probably say, hi, I'm Nick. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and I think in terms of the work that I do, I really want to transmit like a passion for the characters and the scenes and just basically everything that I touch. Um, when I'm designing or working with like pre-existing characters from a franchise, I'm always trying to get into the heads of who's going to receive it on the other end and imagine either what they already love about a character or what they're going to love about the character I'm trying to design and uh, really like create an experience for, for them. Um, so that's definitely like a high on my list of priorities. Um, and then for me, there's just like a, a desire to create designs with like warmth and um, just like a, a a loveliness. I think recently in my work, the word elegance is something I'm trying to chase. I don't know that I've achieved that. But when I sit down to draw, I try to think of like, I would like to pursue not just something that's like cool and loud and extreme or whatever, uh, not just something that hits you really fast and then kind of vanishes in your memory but something that has a little bit of an elegance and maybe something that kind of sticks with you after you've, you've stopped looking at it. Um, so those are my goals. Uh, you know, I'm an illustrator, character designer. I've worked across like toys and games and comics, movies and TV shows. Um, and all throughout that, my main like desire that I think is common to all of those is just that experience of the person receiving the art on the other end and wanting to really like uh, have an experience of connection between myself, the work I'm doing and the way they're receiving it. That's wonderful. I, you know, one of the things uh, we watched some of your previous interviews and in preparing to get to talk to you today. And one of the things um, I heard you mention in an interview you gave a couple of years ago that I absolutely love is that you want to put the kind of stuff in the world that you yourself want to see. Mm. And when I look at your art, uh, just this week, Liam and I were talking, we were, we were looking through a lot of your art and watching some of your interviews. And, and I was just like, his art is joy. Like, I feel like your art yeah. is joy. Um, even when you're portraying something like solemn, it just there, you can see the joy that you are putting, um, putting into it. But kind of my question is what, what is it that you want to see in the world that you're trying to put out there through your art? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a tall order through just images to try and transmit stuff like joy. And uh, thank you for saying that. That's really sweet. That really warms <laughs> my heart to hear. Um, I, I just, I, I suppose that life is very difficult yeah. and very full of awful things so often for all of us. And, and yet our lives are also full of like wonderful things and love and warmth and friendship. And, and when I think of wanting to transmit anything out there when I sit down to create um I really want to channel those those best experiences those things that are uh that make me glad to be a human you know the the yeah. the um sharing and the the sense of like love and sacrifice and and honor and the, it's the good things of being alive you know that uh, I guess my analogy uh sometimes has been my mom growing up really loved food analogies. So I, I've inherited that in a big way. Um, I think that 
especially when we're doing art that is um colorful and and aimed at like a, a broad kind of all audiences uh kind of uh, swath of the population we are making a like a, like a meal in a way for people and i think that like i think of myself a little bit as like a confectioner you know i like i make mm -hmm. sweets i make nice sides maybe not the whole meal maybe like you need other things you know maybe it's it would be good to digest a full set of different stuff but when i'm making something that i know is intended to be sweet i want it to be you know as as tasty and and you know good as possible and and i know that it's part of a human experience that's bigger than just what i'm giving you know it's it's just yeah. it fits in there as like oh it's like a nice little oh little warm hug little dessert little something to <laughs> yes. enjoy yeah. i definitely i can definitely see that in your work so well it's fun and you, you still you can still convey like in your work it's not all um you know uh warm and fuzzy because you do have characters like the some of the christmas spirits um like the, mm -hmm. the ghost of christmas um yet to come um is an interpretation you've done and it's it's a serious scary character um and so you do it in a way that you still capture that um the ominous feeling of the character but bring to it and there's an approachability to it um that other scarier renditions don't have so um i don't know I, yeah just an observation and it comes from the source story like i, I overall the story of a christmas carol is such a source of like warmth and hope and like that feeling around the Christmas time when you're like, Oh, I love, you know, just this coziness. And I think that that flavors all the designs when I'm approaching that kind of thing. I'm like, Oh, you know, there's, there's still this feeling I want them to fit into, you know, within the space, of the narrative. And sometimes if you go too hard into like, this is going to be like literal death, like this <laughs> dripping and, you know, bits of skin and, you know, that can becomes so grotesque that it's distracting you know it kind of pops you out of the world of the story um and i think inherently that story is about you know redemption and um and so the ghosts are scary but they're they're scary within a context right mm -hmm. yeah you know that so um there's something else i wanted to ask about so it, the and the christmas story dovetails nicely into it um you have done a lot of work um, reimagining or or trying to access characters that that other people have defined um, or that other people have created. For example, you know, in video games, Spyro, Crash Bandicoot. Um, one of my favorites is an interpretation you did of Pocoroso um, from a, a brilliant Studio Ghibli film, um, The Christmas Spirits, um, and there's there's several others. Um, so, what is that like trying to? And you, you kind of touched it already with the Christmas, uh, the Christmas story. But what is it like um, trying to access, you know, a world that already exists? And then, um, how do you go about finding a fresh take uh, for those characters? Mm. I think, like, with Porco as an example, or the Christmas Carol characters, like, I am so in love with both of those stories and movies i got a, a little uh porco rosso print hanging right i there, saw so. that in the <laughs> background i was like that's fantastic <laughs> yeah, yeah. man after um, our own heart we love ghibli yeah. <laughs> a huge ghibli fan so <laughs> i uh it's so easy to just access that feeling and want to sort of i don't know there's an impulse that artists have when they make fan art mm -hmm. and it's hard to pin down exactly what it is it's just like a you see something, you love it, you feel the joy of it, and you want to like kind of play with it yourself, you know, and kind of participate. Um, and that's, it, it's just like maybe some of the purest, most like kind of uh, similar to sitting in your playroom with your crayons as a kid kind of type of art that you make where you're just like, I like Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm going to draw Sonic the Hedgehog, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to make it the Sonicest Sonic I can. And I just, I love that about it. Um, and so when I do it for myself as fan art, that's all that's about. It's just, I, you can do it as like a cynical exercise and trying to get eyeballs on your stuff and just sort of try and generate pop culture interest in your work. And that's, you know, I, I can't fault anybody for for doing that. It's a big, broad internet. And <laughs> attention is short for people. But um, I think uh, the best stuff, and you could sense it when somebody really loves the source material and really cares mm -hmm. about it. Um, and with Spyro and Crash, when we, you know, got to work on those in a, a like professional capacity, the whole team, we were trying to channel that that passion, that love. With Spyro especially, it was super easy for me because I played that as a kid and I had those formative memories of passing the controller back and forth with my sister. And um, 
just like accessing this world that at the time was so big in our imaginations. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case, you know, getting to explore that imagined space, even though when you look back, you know, decades later at that, like the polygons can't hold everything that your imagination supplied, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny. I have to say, uh, Aaron didn't play a lot of video games growing up. I was the gamer, but one game that she, uh, I learned very quickly in our relationship that she did play was Crash Bandicoot. And we bought a PlayStation <laughs> just so she could play Crash. And um, so when Aaron saw, when we saw Crash uh, on your website, and your portfolio, it was very exciting. Um, but, but to that, I didn't play that as a kid. And so mm -hmm. when I encountered that game for the first time as an adult, and I saw how, you know, for me, it was dated and I was, I was watching it. It wasn't quite I don't know. It, but for Aaron, having grown up with that um, world, she was able to inhabit it in a way um, because of, of the point in her life when she encountered it uh, that that I wasn't. And so, you mm -hmm. know, it's what you're saying about um, the limitations of the polygons and creating this world, filling in the gaps. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Resonates. That's interesting. Totally. Yeah. I, I mean, we bring like there's there's a way that nostalgia gets used in the world that can feel like, again, like I said, pretty cynical. Mm -hmm. But there's something we all experience it you know, as a mm -hmm. profound thing, you know, we don't experience it yeah. as a cynical cash grab thing. We experience it as like, oh, I love Crash Bandicoot. You know, like I played that. I, I remember sitting in, you know, the uh, playroom of a friend, like the carpet really thick. I remember yep. the color of the drapes, you know, I remember the context where I first encountered those games. Um, and Peace it's- pockets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it, you know, you remember- little bits little details um the flavor you know the the human beings around that moment and i think that's pretty precious and and when we get to like touch on things like that for people there's a mixture of wanting to do something new wanting to to put your own stamp on it wanting to make uh art that's new and and says something about you but there's also this kind of sacred thing for the fans of that franchise um that you don't want to push too hard on. And I know I've like had some success and some failures designed to design on some of these franchises. I know with Spyro in particular, um, I put legs on Sparks, the dragonfly mm -hmm. as a design thing. As we were starting to increase the level of detail, it started to feel weirder to me that like the dragonfly didn't have legs. Oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, as the, you know, more blades of individual grass, there were flowers right. of petals in the world, you know, and so suddenly this legless dragonfly felt more and more strange. Um, and it was, I think it was like the wrong call, <laughs> like straight up. I think that uh, the people who love that character love the graphic, simple, legless cartoon of that character. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you, Sometimes you win, sometimes you miss the mark a little bit, um, you know, but I think overall the spirit of those games was, you know, something we really tried to channel as best we could. That's a fascinating example. I mean, one thing, and um, I'm going a little bit off script, but I have to ask, like, what is it like for you to imagine that there is a little Nick out in the world getting to experience your version of Spyro or a little Aaron out in the world getting to experience your version of Crash Bandicoot for the first time. Like those formative memories that you had with Spyro that I had with Crash, you're right. Like sitting in my best friend's living room, you know, eating Lunchables, like playing Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> yeah. Like you're able, you are a part of that story now and mm -hmm. being able to create those memories for that next generation um is that something while you're creating the art that you you think about or is it are you just really kind of in the moment while you're making making the piece and then put it out into the world that's a good question and it is a bit of both because we are fully formed adults making this stuff yeah. for kids who may encounter it for the first time but as a grown-up doing this um, you're multitasking, you're spending hours on a drawing. So like some of that time that you're spending on it is fully locked in and just you're vibing and you're just completely in that like zone of being lost in the experience just for you. And then there's multiple moments through the process when you step back and you're like, oh, someone's going to see this. You know, someone's going to receive this. Maybe a kid's going to get this. Like, how would they feel? Um, and some things you channel that more strongly than others. I think with like book covers, when I do book covers, so for things like uh, the Wing Feather Saga, I think a lot about 
the kid on the other end of that, you know, where they're mm-hmm. walking through the Barnes and Noble or wherever they encounter it. And they see the spine and, and then they check it out and, you know, see the cover for the first time. Mm-hmm. I really think of Little Nick when I do that. Because I still remember, you know, I'm a big Redwall fan from back in the day. Um, the yeah, Brian, the Brian Jakes is my favorite. <laughs> the best, right? Yeah. <laughs> so lovely. And so, again, that, that warmth just sort of permeates the books. And um, and that was the first book I ever got to buy for myself. So I remember as like a, I don't know, 11, 12 year old, my mom gave me like a little bit of money and just set me loose in the bookstore and was like, you pick today. And I was like, I get to choose, you know, mm-hmm. and I I saw the spine and it had all the oranges and a little bit of like hint of wrapping around the squirrels with spears. And I was like, what is that? And I have it here somewhere. I don't know. It's somewhere in the office, but I still have the copy I got then um, of Martin the Warrior. And it had the you know little mouse of the sword leading the charge. And for little Nick, it didn't need to be more complicated than that. It didn't need to be especially nuanced. It didn't need to be layered. It just needed to be a mouse with a sword at sunset. And I was like, this rules. I'm going to read this. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's so awesome. So, I mean, we talked about a lot of different worlds. Is there a specific character or a specific world that you have always wanted the opportunity to reimagine and get to be a part of that story that you have? (laughs) Redwall. (laughs) 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 Absolutely. I would love to be a part of any of that. I'm actually working on a personal piece just because it's been on my mind a lot recently um of a martin the warrior illustration trying to channel that feeling i had when i was that that age mm-hmm. um let's see what else uh i'm a big nintendo fan honestly just mm-hmm. across the board and there's so many franchises within that mm-hmm. realm of you know there's uh, the classic ones like zelda and mario that i would love to just like get to play with mm-hmm. um not even ch- not change it in any meaningful way. Just I just want to be a part of it. I just want to touch it. You know, the same yeah. way that fan art impulse. I just want to like get my crayons out and you know just kind of mess with Mario characters. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then the newer ones too. I'm a huge Splatoon fan. Um, and uh, there's a lot of interesting new energy with some of the younger kind of generation of Nintendo developers, and it seems like there's some exciting stuff coming up. So. Yeah, that would probably be some mix of of those things, Redwall and Nintendo Nintendo stuff. Redwall. (laughs) I do have to say, it's interesting that Redwall resonated with you because it it those books do something similar to your work, I think, in that um, you know, Redwall is is my when I was growing up was like my first exposure to I don't want to say evil, but but there's a scene in like the first few pages of Redwall where one of the villains does something awful. And you don't see it coming because you're dealing with rats and mice and what you grow up thinking of as little fuzzy, warm characters. And um, for me, those books allowed me to explore this idea of selfishness and evil and, you know, terrible things happening to people, but in a way that was approachable and I could access it as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I feel like with your work, it it is similar um, in that you do create this veneer um, this whimsy that allows you to explore again with the Christmas spirits, um, sometimes uh, mm-hmm. darker or or uh, more grown up lessons. I don't know. No, you've uh, you've nailed it. That's exactly it. When I mentioned it being like scary within a context, like mm-hmm. that's I I love that stuff. Like I uh, that particular crossover for me when there were a couple different Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons back in like mm-hmm. the nineties. Yep. There was kind of the like very wacky, like chili dogs kind of Looney Tunes version of Sonic. Mm-hmm. But I remember the moment they crossed over into it was a Saturday morning, Sat AM yes. Sonic cartoon where they were like part of the resistance and like <laughs> Dr. Robotnik had this like very deep, scary voice and and people were ter- being turned into robots. It was like existential, you know, they were like essentially being for all purposes in the narrative, like killed. And it was this moment of like oh and that little bit flipping in my brain was like huge you know that was a big formative thing redwall did the same martin the warrior was the first one and that was there's a death sort of late in the narrative that's like traumatizing but also Mm -hmm. like well set up and really like you you remember it for a long time so um but it's in a context where it's it's presented alongside these like lovingly described meals, you know, strawberry cordials and you know, <laughs> yes. pasties and, you know, um, and there's friendship and there's warmth and there's goodness. I think that's why I vibe with like Lord of the Rings so much too, is because for all the like 
big windswept intense scary things there's also hobbits mm-hmm. uh grounding the story and like that mixture i really connect with that's the thing i connect with most i don't like to live in a world that's purely just confection you know i want to live in a world where if we're gonna go scary and we're gonna talk about evil acknowledge to me that like a warm meal with friends is still very like good and healing and exists in this world and the the stories that omit that feel Mm -hmm. a little dishonest to me you know because i'm like well most of my life is like very cozy you know like i I, i've been very blessed and very like you know uh to to be around people that i really like and then there are these moments where that suddenly drops off and suddenly Mm -hmm. things happen and you realize like you know that that um tension you know the two things existing together mm-hmm. it's really compelling to me so sorry i went way off no 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 <laughs> um that's, what, that that's like that's Great. fantastic that's definitely what we want so speaking of worlds um like creating worlds and exploring you know different things um can we talk about Jellybox quickly <laughs> because, yeah sure because Jellybox is so you know um, it's always fun uh, when you when you encounter new artists or exploring their portfolio, you know, to look at the commercial work they've done and and you know some of the the franchises they've been a part of. But then it's always really really fun to dig into the indie projects, the personal projects, what you know artists are exploring on their own time for fun. Um, and uh, Jellybots is is a world that you've created. Um, there's a ton of art that I love. The one I wanted to mention that, that really resonates with me, there's so much fun to it, but the Wandering Tides piece, I love, and we'll we'll show that on the screen for anybody mm-hmm. watching, um, because it's almost, these are creatures, but they're almost like nature incarnate. Um, mm-hmm. To go back to Ghibli, there's a very Mononoke kind of mm-hmm. feel to it. Um, so Jellybots, what what led you there? What what are you trying to explore with this world? Um, what is it that, um, that, that, drove you creatively to, to explore this this kind mm. of first off thank you for the the ghibli comparison that's very <laughs> <laughs> it's high praise so i appreciate that um i uh, jelly bots is such a uh, complicated like thing because i i started it over 10 years ago as a series of little explorations and they were born out of uh as a lot of things that i do are it's not spite <laughs> but it is like a an a a little like stubbornness of um, I'm being hired to do X, Y, and Z, but I want to do A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to, to demonstrate a certain like color palette and feel and set of colors. And I just said colors twice, but Mm -hmm. um, just a, a, a vision of science fiction, especially at the time it was like 2009, 10 ish. Like the world of sci-fi was very Brown and very full of zombies um and i just wanted to do something colorful in that space that was optimistic um and prove that out with a couple like low effort characters and then that started to grow into more and more ambitious stuff over time uh became something that i really held dear and it it becomes a little playground for me where i can go away to to do the stuff that nobody's asking me to do because as you're doing this I, you know, i've been freelancing for um around 12 years something like that um and each client will ask things of you that they see in your work or that they want for their own projects. But there's some notable things that people just will never ask you for certain levels of like nuance or sort of, uh, I, I really want you to capture the personality of this character in the design of this in a story in such a way that has these specific like layers and jelly bots is all about like taking a kid, taking this jelly substance and finding ways of like, exploring the, their psychology visually which is like nobody's asking for, for that on a project necessarily um and uh uh yeah it, it just became a place where i could experiment and try things out that were maybe more um weird you know that, that uh were harder to find another place to slot so the things like the watering tides i just kept having this imagination uh, this moment of um coming across a body of water that then sort of starts to move and then lifts off and glides away. And you realize that the, what you thought was a pond or a lake or even an ocean was, was not all along. And just that moment of awe, you know, trying to communicate a surprise and a moment of like, yeah, of sort of feeling stunned, you know, uh, in a character design was the challenge I wanted to kind of tackle. 
Um, so I, I, I try to do that as often as I can. Crash Bandicoot has a few of those where I'm trying to look for moments of like, you see this and oh, there's a bit of a surprise hidden mm -hmm. in the design or in the context narratively. Um, so awesome. That's kind of what I'm doing with that. <laughs> I kind of want to, there, there's, a, there's a question I wanted to ask and that kind of dovetails nicely from this where you talk about the dichotomy between um, what science fiction tended to be ages ago and, and what you're doing with it. Um, and and if I could talk about the color pink, uh, and I hate, you know, sometimes I hate picking up, <laughs> sure. you know, things you've talked about in other interviews because, you know, it's, you say all the same stories over and over again, but, but this was such, this story really resonated with me for two reasons. One is I think it tells a lot about your, um, you know, you as an artist, but then also um, it resonated with me because for me personally, I love the color pink. Um, if you asked me, you know, 10 years ago, what my favorite color was, I would have said blue or, or green. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a moment where pink was my favorite color. I didn't want to admit it. I don't know why. And, and I shied <laughs> away from the color. Um, and then one day I was like, you know what? I love pink. Pink is my favorite color. I bought a pink shirt. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not scared to tell anybody pink is my favorite color because, because I love it. So you have a story about uh, your experience with this with this color um, as you were, you know, training uh, for your for your career, and um, I, I love it if you'd share it. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I I always tell people, and they don't believe me, so maybe I could find a piece of art as an example to share with you. You could put it on screen or something. But yeah, I came from the grim dark. That was where, and maybe that helps people who don't <laughs> kind of get why I'm so interested in the warmth and the, you know, wholesomeness and work, but I, I didn't start there. You know, I, I started doing really gory, grim, black and white, very detailed kind of cross hatched drawings. Um, and part of that was a genuine like phase I was going through as a person, but a lot of that was honestly, as a little boy growing up at the time that I was growing up, I just felt like that was what I that was what was getting feedback from other dudes you know oh that's sick man and the moment they saw something cute or nuanced whimsical someone smiling they didn't know what to do with that there was the the feedback stopped so oh yeah that's a good drawing man yeah that's cool you know but that skull barfing up like a lung you know with the, the heart covered in barbed wire that's sick man and they had the vocabulary to sort of praise that so i i I kind of went along that track for a long time thinking that that was what I was into. And then in college, I was, um, you know, I realized <laughs> after a while I had never drawn children, women, people smiling, uh, or used the color pink. Like these were just things that were just like off limits psychologically for me at the time, which was wild looking back. But, um, uh, and, uh, I was in the a color specific class with a professor of mine, uh, Mary Jane Begin, who's awesome. Um, and she specifically called me out. There was a couple of professors at the time who kind of could see this in me, but she mentioned it in a critique and she was like, you know, Nick, this, this piece is pretty good. This is good. I like the greens and the browns you've used, but you know what could really wake up the light in this piece? And I was like, what? She was like, the color pink. And I was like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> that's not very manly. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, in that moment, when I was directly confronted with it, I realized like I literally have been avoiding a chunk of the color wheel because I have a, I have a hang up somewhere, you know, about like, I can't, I can't like this. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tried it. I took a little pink and I brushed it in and it immediately did what she said. It woke up the whole piece and I suddenly started trying it again and again and it unlocked this whole dimension of my interests and art and everything. A couple other professors at the same time were saying like, so like, you know, this is very grim and very, but when I interact with you, you don't feel that way. Like you're not that kind of person. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. Um, uh -huh. uh, and uh, that started to sort of shift and creak and fall apart. And and soon enough, I was like experimenting and learning and, and, and I discovered this whole new side of of the work I was doing in myself which was really great and now it's like all I do and the jelly bots was when I mentioned like wanting to explore a particular color palette like the the place from maybe some pink sometimes to like what if pink like what if I did pink on purpose that was very much like the jelly bot space for me so um I'd love to talk a little bit about like collaboration with other artists um you were the uh production designer for the wing feather saga 
What was it like to, to lead a team of artists to create a cohesive world? Um, and yeah, just wrap it working with a bunch of artists with a bunch of different perspectives to create like one work. Yeah. And let's plug wing feather because it's coming out soon and it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So I'm really excited. It, I should clarify. I was the production designer on the original short that we produced okay. uh, years ago. And because of other job conflict stuff, I've been doing character designs for the full fledged show that's coming out soon, but just not as production designer. Um, okay but I'm cheering them on and it's an amazing thing. I got to do the book covers for the wing feather books and um, it's a great series. You know, I, the way I connected with them was very weird and windy and I won't go into the, the details, but I did wind up suddenly just in this random email thread with the writer and some of the producers and people around the project. And uh, they were like, you should read it, read it and let us know what you think. And I read a little bit of it and I was like, Oh, I, I love this. Like this, this is immediately, there's a, especially in that first book, there's a warmth and a comedy and a playfulness um, mixed with, again, that like threat, that kind of like feeling of, of high stakes. Um, so I immediately vibed. And then as we started to talk about, you know, how to to put more flesh on those, those bones collaboratively and, and bring the team in, we were bringing people from all over. I was trying to like, you know, bring in contacts, college friends and st people that I've worked with before and people who I never had the chance to work with, but wanted to. And we, we pulled them in on the, you know, shoestring budget, kind of a wing and a prayer kind of, you know, okay, like we're, we're really hoping that we do this little thing and it turns into a bigger thing. Um, and uh, getting to, to lead that effort creatively was really satisfying, but also really like, uh, stressful i mean it, it's it's a lot you know to take to go from i know what i want and i can do it myself and i'm gonna do it myself because that's all that's the limit of my job mm -hmm. to i know what i want but i i need to communicate that and i actually need to like step aside and allow for other people's desires and visions and what they want to come to the table and mix and create something new and not be a little petty tyrant who's like throw it better my way <laughs> you know like uh was key so you know it was a struggle to be honest with you it was it was awesome and it was a great learning experience and that team was incredible um and the 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 spirit of the project was so uh lovely and and kept us going you know uh and i'm really excited to see the show now um definitely not everybody who draws well has like a really great like organizational wing of their personality <laughs> so i need a lot of help there too where I was like able to give notes, but when it came to like really setting up frameworks for people to work, it's like I need I need people whose brains work that way, you know. Yeah. Um. So we heard it once again in another interview that you um have had a a friendship and a um professional relationship with John Lauren throughout the years, and we know that um he created um some work that we've already seen for Lorcana as well, um. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what um, that has been like over the years? It looks like y'all's career paths um, come together every every few years for y'all to be able to collaborate on something. And we're really excited to see what um, y'all have been able to kind of collaborate on in Lorcana as we start to see more, um, more of that come out in the next year. Um, but can you talk a little bit about kind of y'all's history and and what it's like to get to work with the same artist over and over and over again throughout the years totally yeah yeah john's awesome i love john he we've been good friends since my first gig which was at 38 studios out of like the boston area that's a whole big pile of drama it was a video game company that fell apart um but we met each other and at the time he was working as an animator um 3d animator on an mmorpg and i was doing concept art and we just kind of clicked as people um and i knew under the surface he wanted to be an illustrator and wanted to do a lot more um color texture you know just illustrative work and when that company fell apart we both like wound up looking for gigs and at the same place we connected at cloud kid which was an animation studio there and and that was like the first time we reconnected. And then a, a year later, we wound up on Dawngate together. And uh, I brought him in as a, a colorist because we were doing a comic 
it's a whole thing. We were trying to do a web comic alongside a video game that we were making. Um, and so John and I got to work really closely at that time. And it was really illustrative and comic driven stuff. Um, and so we really, that was when our style started to kind of mesh and play with each other a lot more. And then from there, you know, we, we wound up on Spyro together, crash together. Uh, uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting a bunch. Um, there have been a number of things and now uh, Lorcana as well, which has just been a delight because it feels like we get each other and we have a, a, a language that we share about work. And even um, when we're not on the same project, he's still the person I will check works in progress by immediately be like, Hey, we, we call it nits. I'm like, got any nits <laughs> picking, but like, you know, yeah. yeah, pick, pick some nits for me, man. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll toss him anything in progress and he'll do the same and we'll just kind of keep in touch about gigs. Um, and uh, it's been great. It's really good in general when you're dealing with stuff that there's not a lot of words for mm -hmm. visually to have somebody that you can really communicate on with, with little shorthand and stuff like that. And you're like, Oh no, he gets it. He knows exactly what I'm going for. And we can, you know, kind of speak a language uh, visually that is harder to connect with, with other folks. That's awesome. That's neat. It reminds me, you know, there's a, as you're talking about this, it reminds me of a documentary uh, we watched recently about um, the origin of Dungeons and Dragons art. Um, mm. And it's, it's, it's brilliant because it has all these old artists from, you know, the eighties who were working together to kind of create, you know, the original D and D. Um, and what was amazing is, is the stories they told about their interactions in the studios. You know, we used to mess with this guy's painting and I used to, you know, this guy used to critique my dragons and, and, you know, I gave him this idea and he explored that and you realize how much um, that uh, the world of Dungeons and Dragons, as we think of it now, um, mm -hmm. and really that was the genesis of a lot of fantasy art is the mm -hmm. result of this creative interaction um, and synthesis between this, this, these, this team um, who, who kind of, you know, grew the world together. Um, and it reminds me of, of, of kind of this interaction with John you're talking about. Totally. Yeah. I, I'm a big believer in that. I think that the little communities we have uh, of collaborators are are always huge for that. You know, the story about like Tolkien and the Inklings, the C.S. Lewis and other writers that mm -hmm. kind of grouped up, they would just meet on the regular at a pub and go over each other's work in, in granular detail and just chum around and be people to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but a ton of there's record of all these letters between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, you know, where he's like, little little too much hobbit stuff my man you know like maybe like you know <laughs> like describing a lot of food and he's like <laughs> you know and, and vice versa like not sure santa claus should show up in this story dude like <laughs> it just feels kind of weird um and you realize that they're just people and, and that these decisions come out of conversations uh and it's huge especially when you're somebody you can trust you feel like you're on the same page and that really is all about that you're pulling towards the same goal you know, yeah. and I know with people like John and John, especially, you know, we're always heading towards a goal we can both kind of envision that's very similar. And so any critique that comes from him comes from experience. He knows what he's talking about. And I think we both know where we're trying to head together. So that's huge. I, you know, talking about like the, the Tolkien and Lewis thing and, and, you know, that they are just people. That's, that's one of the things that we're really excited about um, exploring, like on our channel is that there there is a human behind this work of art you know I, I we have a couple more questions but I do just want to like reiterate how grateful we are that you agreed to sit down with us and and let people kind of get to know you and your personality and and I think that now when people see your work in Lorcana um in the coming months and in, in next year when when the game comes out getting to know you um a little bit deepens your work. Um, and, and I know now that when I look at, you know, Mickey, I'm going to, I'm going to experience him in a little bit of a different, different way. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, actually, I wish I could say more, but I'll just say thank you. Yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> that's, yep, yep, that's all you yep. have to say. <laughs> We're good. We're, we'll, uh, we'll, get so actually that's a, that's a fun segue because, um, in the interest of getting to know you, um, we have, a, we have a fun exercise we'd kind of like to, to you know, uh, close to, to wrap up with. Yeah. Um, if you ever watch Inside the Actor's Studio, um, they always close the <laughs> interviews with the actors with a series of questions. Um, and uh, they're kind of fun, somewhat whimsical. And and um, we'd like to go through these 10 questions because we think it'd be fun. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, this was actually based on a questionnaire that Proust, uh, created back in the 1800s. So there are 10, he had 35 questions. We're going to only ask you 10. Um, okay. but <laughs> the first question is what sound or noise do you love? Oh, oh, okay. Hold on. <laughs> sound or noise do I love? I... I can, I'm only thinking of sounds I don't like right now. And then I'm like, my wife's voice. Well, that's we'll the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife's voice, I think that's a fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I love I love a good laugh. You know, I love hearing somebody genuinely belly laugh, even when it's like super awkward. But when you can tell they're a little bit out of control, that's the best sound. Awesome. So what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, sandpaper the especially like nails or fingers across sandpaper or sandpaper across like it, just sandpaper the sound of sandpaper <laughs> i've had to like leave rooms <laughs> where sandpaper is being used like i just i gotta go i'm having <laughs> a bad feeling um what is your idea of happiness hmm i think it's community i think my idea of happiness is intrinsically about togetherness and that could be very small um but i think that it's a it's a big table with food for everyone and uh, yeah yeah that's that's probably the visual that comes immediately to mind who's your favorite hero in fiction oh, oh, oh. um <laughs> I'm going to go with Bilbo Baggins. Um, I think in particular, there's a refrain that they come back to often in The Hobbit, where they talk about some big thing happens, some big, scary, threatening, adventurous thing. And he comes back to the camp at night into his sort of sleeping bag, and he dreams of home, not for the last time. And I just... I just love that. I think that's so sweet. And there's something like so charming about his reluctance um, and his arc into sort of owning uh, the adventure and in, in the end kind of becoming someone who craves it. But starting out as somebody who's just like, yeah, man, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to sit, uh, you know, sleep uh, on, on rocks in the rain at night in a mountain. You know, that that does not sound like a good time to me either, man. So Bilbo. Um, who is your favorite heroine in fiction? Mm. Um, oh, I think in a Disney characters immediately, which is like, come on, like, like two on the nose. Um, <laughs> uh, favorite heroine. I really, so actually let's go Ghibli. I think that uh, this is weird. I don't know why this, maybe it's because we were talking about Porco. But Fio from Porco Rosso, I think of her often as like a really great archetype for a heroine. And like, she just trusts and believes and is like determined. She's a hard worker, but she kind of like cares so much. And this this sort of selfish pig is so like such a drag, you know, and 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 she kind of like carries the 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 burden of like carrying him back into it's not about him as much as just like she's an admirable person for for sticking with with her gun to her guns to that extent and just kind of like saying no <laughs> pretty often i think she's great for that all right what talent would you most like to have talent uh no we're not talking superpowers right we're talking talent Let's say talent, but if you want to provide a superhero answer, you, uh, you can <laughs> as well. Let's stick with talent. I wish I could play an instrument. And particularly, I think, like, either the violin or the piano. Um, I tried it as a kid, and I think because I got good at art early on and wasn't immediately good at the violin, I was like, nah, I don't want to do this. I'm going to go <laughs> draw. <laughs> um, which sucks. I wish I had stuck with it. Um, what is your most treasured possession? I, honestly, I mean, since we, we stick with it thematically, that beat up, chewed up copy of Martin the Warrior uh, from when I was a kid. I, I look back at that often and I, it just gives me a sense of connection to that that little kid I was at the time. Yeah. What are your favorite names? 
Ooh. Uh, my wife's name, Erica, I like very much. When we've talked about names we like, we like Chloe. That sounds like a bell. I like that very much. And Robin. I like Robin a lot. Those are great names. Um, what is your motto? My motto? <laughs> um, I wish it was something really cool and, and it encapsulated more of the positive, but the only thing that rises to mind immediately is the one thing I've had to write over <laughs> uh, boards or on paper often is that uh, your success is not my failure. They struggle mm-hmm. with jealousy a lot. Yeah. Uh, when I see somebody doing something amazing and I have to always come back to, you know what? It's incredible that they've achieved that. And it doesn't mean that I failed to achieve it, you know, to remind myself that often. That's good. That's something good to keep in mind. Last, <laughs> last question. What is one question we didn't ask you that you wish we would have? Uh, you guys actually ask really good questions across the board. <laughs> so I feel like thoroughly well interviewed here um a question i wish you asked me <laughs> uh I, you know i've got this cold that i feel like i'm i'm in no place to belt out my uh favorite song uh from a disney musical but you know if you had asked i i might have uh, obliged <laughs> And what would you have said if we asked which your favorite song was? <laughs> you don't have to sing it. You just walked right into that one, Nick. <laughs> I know. I kind of provided the noose to hang myself with here. Um, you don't I would have to probably sing it, have tried. Well, I really won't. <laughs> Make yeah. your podcast unwatchable. <laughs> um, uh, you're wearing that Powerline shirt. It's got to be eye to eye from. <laughs> Hanging behind me right here is Claire Hummel's It's Glare City over there, but it's the map uh, of America from a Goofy yes. movie. Yes, yes, oh it is. Gosh. I thought that was a window because of the glare, but now that you see, I can see it around the edges. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's so good. One of my one of my favorite jokes is it's been two decades and I'm still waiting for the rest of this album to drop. Uh, <laughs> so true, man. Seriously. Man, it's have Tevin, Tevin Campbell, Campbell did more than two songs, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Ah, so good. We hope you fell in love with Nick as much as we did. You know, Aaron, he really stands out above the crowd. <laughs> uh, we can't wait to see more of Nick's work. To be clear, we have no idea whether he has done any more Larkana cards, uh, but whether he has or not, we're excited to see what other projects he brings to life in the future. I really, really hope that he does more cards. I really, really hope that too. If you enjoyed Nick's work, make sure you check out The Wing Feather Saga along with Scrooge A Christmas Carol on Netflix. And we'll also link to his website and socials in the description below. If you enjoyed this, again, please consider subscribing or liking or both. And if you like card game art, please consider checking out our artist per video right here on my face. <laughs> Bye, Lumiteers. <Lumetiers. laughs>